Welcome to Photonics in Focus, the podcast where industry leaders and innovators share insights into the latest advancements in integrated photonics technology. Join us as we explore how this emerging technology is transforming the industries and driving new possibilities, and how AIM Photonics is at the forefront of this revolution. Tune in to stay ahead of the curve in the rapidly evolving world of photonics. In this episode, Nathan Lynn, the Director of Outreach at AIM Photonics, is joined by Dr. John Bowers, Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Materials at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Bowers received his Master of Science and PhD degrees from Stanford University and worked for AT&T Bell Laboratories in Honeywell before joining UCSB, where his primary research is focused on silicon photonic integrated circuits. In addition to his notable academic career, Professor Bowers was also a driving force in the inception and launch of AIM Photonics, and we're really honored to talk to him today about the Institute's evolution and what it holds for the future of the industry. I'm here today with Professor John Bowers. Honored to be here. Uh, how are you doing? Glad to have you out here. Yeah, and I, I know you've been involved with AIM since the beginning. Could you share a little bit about your history, what vision you had, and what, what do you think the field is going? You know, the country photonics industry came together to advocate for a manufacturing institute based on photonics. And uh, there's a big, you know, national competition. Pretty much every university and company that did photonics was submitted a proposal and, and uh, in the end, three were selected uh, for the final push. And uh, so again, a lot of us got together to develop that proposal and the vision of what AIM is today. And uh, that as, you know, luckily the, our proposal was selected and, and AIM became uh, what it is today. And did you have in mind kind of fast following your production for transceivers when you're at that spot or you were you thinking more like, hey, this try a little bit of everything, let's see what an agreement for tonics get. Well, there's certainly a big need in the United States for a rapid turnaround, responsive, dynamic, one that you could modify to adjust for changing requirements on the photonic integrated circuits. So for me personally, I've, I've been involved in, you know, fiber optics and transceivers for, you know, since the days when I was at Bell Laboratories. And so I always focused on that. And that is certainly by far the biggest application with silicon photonics. But there's a lot of big applications in sensors in particular, uh, but a lot of other, uh, you know, atomic physics and, and things like that, quantum physics. And so uh, it's required a lot of evolution. You know, when we started, there was very little, right? The PDK was very primitive. The devices were primitive, pretty much just worked at 1550. And, uh, but we had this vision that you provide a resource with very complex specs with very good performance. And the nice thing about the SUNY facility is that it's, you know, incredible, right? It, it was way beyond most of the photonic boundaries then and is still today. And uh, consequently, a lot of rapid turnaround and a lot of research by a whole lot of people. Uh, it now works not just at 1550, but 1310, and now expanded into visible. So the, the whole quantum uh, offering is, is really exciting. And there's a whole lot of new applications in the visible that we probably didn't contemplate when we first started this. So what kind of uh, involvement have you had with AIM throughout the years? Well, I, I was certainly involved in writing the original proposal, uh, but I was the deputy CEO for the first basically almost uh, six, six years of, of the program. So supporting initially Michael Lear, who was the CEO of AIM, and, and he really carried the Yeoman's load of, of making it all happen. Yeah. Uh, I was responsible for the West Coast portion of it and involvement of the companies in the West Coast and universities to, to use AIM. And what were some of the technology breakthroughs that you have done uh, using AIM? Or what kind of thing were you, are you trying to achieve now with doing the projects? With them? Well, one big advance has been, you know, expanding into 1310. So again, all the elements had to be and redesigned and, and refined to work well at 1300. And uh, that has worked well. So, we're, you know, we're making terabit transceivers. So those are pretty complex devices, you know, with hundreds of elements, but that field is moving very, very fast. So, you know, today the industry is at 3.2 terabit transceiver, 
transceivers. And, you know, that requires hundreds of, of devices working at very high speed, some very high performance, very low loss. And the AIM platform is very good at that. I mean, it, it works better than I ever anticipated. The coupling losses are lower than I ever thought we could achieve. So uh, it's been very satisfying. And with the advancement of AIM photonics with the electronic interposer, active interposer, and 2.5D integration, uh, what do you have in mind, I guess, just in general, where the trend is going? Is this like co-package optics, we must go there? Or where is the like, photonics going next? Well, you know, historically it has been, say, you know, 2D or 2.5D. So you've got the PIC and you've got the electronic IC uh, on some interposer. But the densities are too low. So where the field is going, you know, we're at 50 terabit per second chips today, moving to 100 this, later this year, probably in September. We'll need 200 terabits two years after that. And so the density is just not high enough. So you can't even do monolithic. You know, having electronics, photonics in the same plane does not have nearly enough density. But when you do 3D, when you stack one on the other, then you can use the most advanced electronics, uh, literally, you know, three nanometer below, which might be needed to get to the very high speeds, you know, 200 gigabaud spurts of speeds. Uh, but the density now gets incredibly high. And that's what's needed because the, the demands of a modern GPU or CPU or, or high bandwidth memory are just, just so high. And with the limitation on some of the devices in terms of analog bandwidth, that's say for, for the photo detector and the modulator, and since and the passive component has mostly developed, do you think silicon photonics technology is mature in, in a way? And where do you think it should go? It's not mature. Um, it's still rapidly evolving and it's gone much further than probably any of us thought, right? So if you think back to, you know, sort of the 2000 time five time frame, the uh, you know, phosphide modulators are quite good, you know, they're electroptic and, and, uh, certainly at 25 gigabit per second, they, they were dominant for a silicon, you know, which, which is, uh, not electroptic and, uh, people we're happy just initially to get one gigahertz modulation and then 10 gigahertz modulation. And now, you know, the best devices are working at 200 gigabaud, which exceeds any of our expectations and takes a lot of process development to get, you know, small rings and low capacitance to be able to drive at such high speeds. But the end result is I think they work probably better than, you know, native substrate indie phosphide devices. Uh, you know, Intel has demonstrated this in spades. They, the fact that silicon photonics is very reliable, but also that integration makes things more reliable. So the Vixel transceivers that existed when we started AIM dominated the data centers, you know, had a fit level of failure uh, in time of, of about a thousand. And then in the phosphide integrated circuits came along and they dropped that down to, you know, say 50, which is a huge advance. But now, you know, Intel's silicon photonic transceivers operate at like 0.2 fit, just kind of unbelievable. And we really required lots of integration, but also the fact that there are no exposed 3.5 facets. So any of these indiphosphide picks have exposed facets or gotten arsenide and they have, you know, dark line defect growth from these exposed facets. And uh, when you integrate the laser on there and, and passivate everything inside SiO2, that means you don't need hermetic sealing, which is important for low cost but also the reliability just gets so much better. So one key word I keep hearing you say is integration. So it's the assembly step and packaging step, like where it's going next in terms of development for next level, next generation transceivers or development. Well, yeah, it's just like the IC industry. If you took, you know, like the processor in your, in your iPhone, if that were made into screens, it would be huge. It would literally take, you know, a megawatt of power to drive and not be very reliable, obviously not cost effective. So, I mean, integration is, is essential to get the power down, to get reliability up. And we're seeing that with PICS. So, uh, as we integrate more devices together, the reliability is getting better and the yield is getting better. And, uh, it now does get to other issues like packaging, but again, the fewer fiber components you have, the more reliable it is, the cheaper it is. And so pushing more wavelengths and higher speeds gets us what we need um, without with higher levels of integration. So yeah, that is essential. So what is the main challenge you see with this field and how do you call upon listeners, ecosystem to best contribute or invest in, 
in that, in terms of making this field kind of growing, growing more. Well, the, the, the big challenge for transceivers is power, right? So, you know, it, it, it takes, say, five watts to get the 100 gigabit transceiver. And then if you want to go to a, a terabit transceiver, you can't put 50 watts in that same little transceiver. It just doesn't, can't dissipate that much heat. So the electronics industry needs photonics, right? They, they can drive these long copper lines that you know, take a lot of, you know, typically half the energy of an IC goes to drive in the ice the electrical lines. And as you go up in baud rate, then the losses just become prohibited, right? 20, 30 dB on just a short length. Yeah. So photonics has to move inside the package and eventually, uh, you know, monolithically 3D integrated with the, with the electronics. And that saves orders of magnitude to power. And that's what, that's what the, you know, data centers need. That's what, what, you know, chips need. So as to, to not just melt down when, 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 when back. When you're referring to monolithic or referring to global foundries kind of photonics for example. form. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's a very advanced platform. Uh, but the problem when you have all the electronics in the same plane is it just takes up a lot of area. And if you just have all the photonics integrated together, the electronics on top, that's a much more dense solution. It's also much more cost effective because pink devices tend to be pretty big. And so in the end, the cost is proportional to the area. And so if you're in a three nanometer fab, the area of a pick becomes painfully expensive. It's not competitive. On the other hand, if you use an older fab and you know, aim is that way, right? It's a very advanced photonics fab, but it's not advanced from an electronic point of view. It's you know, more of 50 nanometer, not three nanometer. And Consequently, uh, the most cost-effective solution is to use an older fab to make the photonics and the most advanced fab to do the electronics because you need the high speed and the, the low power that you get as you get progressively higher levels of lithography. And a big question I guess I have on a lot of people here is, is co-package optics coming on next or when do you think it's coming? It's here now. It's here so, now. I mean, you know, Intel and Broadcom offer it now. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not required at 50 terabits per second. You can still make things work with electronic interconnects, but it's only a matter of time. It's, it's, it's whether it's dominant at a hundred terabit chips or 200 terabit chips remains to be seen. I personally think it becomes cost effective at a hundred terabit. So certainly Broadcom and Intel and a lot of companies are focused on that now. Okay. So Professor Bauer, I know you worked on different types of laser integration or just uh, fabrication type. There's the coupon laser, there's the monolithic you're doing with him with the quant dot. Could you explain to our listener what it entails and what it's like? So most people, most companies use a separate laser fiber coupled to the pick. And that works very well with what AIM offers today. And for many applications, that's how it will always be. For some applications like very high speed transceivers, you start to have a thousand ports. So you have, you know, say 30 wavelengths and, and lots of fibers, and it becomes difficult to have 30 different lasers fiber coupled into that pick. It becomes expensive and, and, and not high density. So there's a real need, therefore, to integrate the laser onto that chip. One approach is the heterogeneous, where you bond crystalline materials onto silicon. And, uh, that works well. And that's what, you know, we, we developed and licensed Intel and, uh, Orion and others to do, um, but that the next level is then to grow it epitaxially on there. And, and then you can, you don't have the expense, which is large of growing on your know, down marston or any phosphide substrates, but rather you're growing on 300 millimeter silicon. And that, that project, which we have with, with aim has worked very well. So. We now have a commercial source of 300 millimeter wafers of quantum dot lasers that is as good as, as the best in phosphide substrate devices. And so that should be incredibly inexpensive, right? It's like asking, what's the cost of resistor? You know, it's, it's, it's zero, right? It's not even a penny. It's, it's, it's zero. Same thing. If we we're supplying quantum dot lasers on 300 millimeter wafers, you know, the cost is basically zero, right? And, uh, that should open up a lot of new applications for, for AIM. Or just the field in general. That's, yes. I feel like the next game up to the coupon laser approach since every month, the 300 millimeter process. Yes. And that's important for things like sensors, right? So 
if you want to supply the world with blood sensors or glucose sensors or whatever, or uh, you need to get the cost of that pick to be very cheap because users just aren't going to pay for that. And so if you want a disposable device with the light source integrated, you know, it's portable, it's compact, it's cheap. That's the solution. So it's compared to the coupon laser approach is cheaper, but performance wise similar to, to yes. And in some ways it can be better. So, I mean, I think from a reliability point of view, the biggest reliability problem is the fiber coupling between the laser and the fiber and the fiber and the pick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when you integrate that together, then you, you've eliminated that completely. The other big advantage there is in testing because you can really self-test all the devices on the wafer. Uh, in wafer form when, when the laser is integrated. When the laser is off chip, then you have to dice it up and, and then fiber couple. And at that point, it's very late in the stage to decide is that a good pick or a bad pick, basically. And even then, you don't necessarily know the performance and, until the whole system is there. When, when the laser is integrated, you can route the, the bits back to the same transceiver and, and do self-testing. And also in the field, then, once you deploy this, you know, if you have a separate laser that's five or a couple and it dies, you know, you can't test the chip. Whereas when the laser is integrated in the chip, you can do self-testing throughout its lifetime. You can watch it degrade if it is. Um, and you can also provide a spare. So you, it's easy just to put a one by two switch on there and uh, switch in a replacement laser if, if the device. So, you, you know, you get that redundancy allows much better performance. And that's been done, you know, Infinera has done that for years. So you, you're right traditionally supply extra lasers for each pick and they can monitor it and then uh, substitute in a, a backup laser if you did. And, and the user never knows that if the device fails as far as they can tell, you know, the performance was perfect. But with the known good diet approach you said with laser, it's it's good that you always pick the one kind of test it and insert it in, but if it's monolithically grown, wouldn't it depend completely on a guild of the uh, off the laser and if it's not yielding well then you can't loss you know. um, it's always true that yeah if you have if you have a uh process slip that causes you know degradation anything whether it's modulator detectors mm -hmm. or lasers um but in general the more you can integrate things together the the higher the final yield and reliability is going to be mm -hmm. this last question for Ann is where do you think you see the aim, it's roadmap, based on your perspective, where would it go? Would it benefit kind of the, the domestic silica photonics field in the system? So, you know, we've started with using silicon as the waveguide, right? That, that's certainly been AIMS focused for most of its lifetime and most of silicon photonics that way. So for 1300 and 1500 nanometer devices, that works perfectly well. But if you switch to using say nitride waveguides, which AIM is doing, is now offering, uh, you know, quantum and, and uh, visible offerings. Now you get into a whole lot of other applications, AR, VR, atomic physics. And uh, so you're using the silicon substrate and using the very advanced 300 millimeter CMOS processes to make the devices. But there's actually no silicon in that device at all, right? It's, it's uh, uh, not there. And, and uh, so that's a whole new set of applications that I think AIM will grow into and have a big impact in, in, on the country. Thanks for joining us on Photonics in Focus. Be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for more deep dives into the latest advancements with industry experts throughout the integrated photonics ecosystem. For more information about AIM Photonics and the work we're doing to advance the integrated photonic industry in the United States, please visit our website at aimphotonics.com.